Welcome to The Long-Term Investor. Today, I have Ben Carlson, Director of Institutional Asset Management at Ritholtz Wealth Management. But I know him, and maybe you even know him even more so, for his blog, A Wealth of Common Sense, which focuses on wealth management, investments, financial markets, and investor psychology. He is the host of Animal Spirits, which has received several best of recognitions in the finance podcast space. And he also has four books about saving, investing, and money. I'm going to link to all those in the show notes. But Ben, thanks so much for joining me today. What's up, Peter? How's it going? I am doing well. It's funny. I listen to you all the time on Animal Spirits, on Portfolio Rescue, so that normally it's a one-way conversation. I'm just listening to you. So having you on the other end is uh, pretty fun for me. Appreciate you taking the time to do this. And I'm not totally sure how much my audience is familiar with you or your background. So maybe we could just start there, give everybody a little sense of what you do and uh, how you got to where you are. Sure. I work for Red Holtz Wealth Management. We're a wealth management firm based in New York, but we're pretty much uh, all over the country. At least half the firm works remotely. So in terms of the pandemic, that certainly uh, was not a big deal for us in, in terms of uh, remote work and stuff. So we have people all over the place. We work mainly with families wealth management. We do 401k stuff. My f field of expertise actually is uh, the nonprofit space. So I worked with endowments and foundations and pension plans over the years, worked with a handful of smaller ones of those. And then at the, the firm, I wear a bunch of different hats. So part of the right way that we bring in clients is through content. So podcasts and YouTube videos and blog posts and all that stuff. We have a bunch of people, Josh Brown and Barry Ritholt and Michael Batnick and Nick Bajuli and a bunch of other people uh, on staff there that that's ma our main source of funneling marketing and sales and that sort of stuff to get prospects in. If they listen to something they, they like, they hear from us, they want to become a client, they can kind of reach out and uh, I'm part of that team and part of the investment committee. So a bunch of different stuff. It's uh, definitely not something I ever thought I would be doing. Uh, I, I feel like if I, if I was had a career 20 years before the internet, uh, I'd be in some job that I sort of hate myself slowly more and more every day and just sort of lucked out where the internet kind of hit and started a finance blog at the right time and got to know the right people and ended up working with the, the Ritholtz team. And uh, so here we are. Well, to say that you're a prolific writer might be an understatement. And again, those who follow you know you publish something every day and putting something out there that's not just average, but it's consistently good on a daily basis is pretty remarkable. And when I reached out to you, it was in response to a blog post that honestly, I can't remember what the title was, but you had a general theme where it's like, hey, we don't live in a spreadsheet. Not all decisions are going to have the money side of the equation outweigh the life side of the equation. And so I thought today maybe we could talk about a couple of those instances that you and I both run into in our roles where, you know, what you would expect to happen or what the math says doesn't always play out. Does that sound good? Let's do it. Cool. Um, well, I think the one thing that I was shocked early in my career was how little my economics education mattered when I actually became a professional. Because most, I, for reference, I started in June 2007, which was super awesome timing. Um, but everyone said we had to have inflation because interest rates were near the bottom. Or throughout the financial crisis, a lot of things have to happen. Or because the U.S. debt's going to get downgraded. The whole world's going to fall apart. But often the opposite happens. I don't know if there are any examples you can think of in how that even plays into a little of what's going on today. Well, if you go back to April of 2020, the unemployment rate was screaming to 14% from 3% in a little over a month. And the stock market had already bottomed and was rallying in the face of unemployment and people dying and the pandemic. And now we have the opposite case where the labor market is very strong and the stock market is crashing. And yeah, the, these relationships that that seem in a textbook like, oh, it should be simple. You know, if if A happens, then B should happen. And it rarely works like that. And you said your economics textbooks aren't much much help. I got a minor in economics in college, and I wish I would have studied psychology because I think that's that's probably more important for a lot of investors is just understanding people and how unpredictable they can be and how sometimes our reaction is more important to a headline than the actual headline itself. And just, just understanding the way that people react to certain events it, oftentimes is, is not going to be very helpful. Yeah, that last point makes a lot of sense. It's one thing to predict what outcome from any given event happens. It's predicting what the aggregate response of the marketplace is a mix of psychology and calculus that not many people can master. And I also feel like you mentioned going back to if you could do it again to study psychology, you've also written quite a bit on history. I mean, are there any pieces that you feel like sets up an advisor, an advisor, an investor, 
an end client just from having a history background in any of this stuff? Well, that was one of the things that I, when I first started my career, I realized when I'm having these conversations and, and I was working on the institutional side of things. So we're meeting with money managers and consultants. And I realized these people feel like they're speaking a different language to me. And I, I felt like I don't really know what I'm talking about. I was never one of those people that was like 12 years old and reading Barron's or the Wall Street Journal with my dad. And that, like I didn't know what I wanted to do for a very long time. I think even when I was graduating college, I still don't know what the hell I wanted to do. So I didn't have a huge background in this stuff. And I thought one of the best ways that I could figure it out was going back and reading history books, starting off with financial history, right? Understanding what happened in the Great Depression in 1987, in the 1970s, and all in the go-go years of the 60s, all these different periods was helpful. And the, the one theme that helped run across these things is just that human nature is the one constant. And people get too excited when things are going well, and people get too pessimistic when things are going poorly. And that pendulum tends to swing back and forth. And while I, I think every time is different in terms of the market cycle, the economy is different and always kind of changing and evolving, market structure is always different in changing and evolving, people are kind of the same. And even though the reactions aren't going to be the same every time, there's there's this cycle of greed and fear that we go through that seems to be on hyperspeed these days. We, we've gone through it in the last three years. It feels like we've lived through 1929, 1990s, today's part 1970s. But I, I don't know. It's, it's a little bit of everything. And it's it's maybe happening faster because of technology. But that, that thing, when you read history and you go, oh, the markets are always kind of risky. They're always at a risk of crash. Bad stuff happens. And then also, good stuff comes of it eventually. And and if you look back at history, and people always think today is just this awful time and the worst stuff ever is happening. And it is there's pretty bad. It's hard to sugarcoat what's going on right now. But the I guess the good thing is the silver lining is we've gotten through worse in the past. And I think that's that's part of history that helps me keep more of a glasses half full kind of mindset is that yeah, bad stuff happens all the time and it's happened throughout history, but people still get up every day and wanna improve themselves and get better and improve their family station life and all that stuff. So I think that that's helpful too. Yeah. It does seem like betting against the human spirit is a bad bet. Um, and things are awful in advance. If you know that things are going to be awful, that can be helpful. But I think one of those other concepts, you know, when I was reading your piece earlier thinking, Hey, like we look at average stock returns all the time. And we talk to individuals about average stock returns. We say, Hey, you can expect this. And even if we tell them there's going to be crashes along the way, in the moment, it is frightening. Um, and I think in general, I mean, us humans, we are just this giant ball of raw emotions and nerves. And so once we start to panic, those more instinctual reactions kick in. To tell someone that it, it's amazing, a lot of people won't even accept the idea of index funds. You know, They want to do better than index funds, but earning the average return is hard enough, wouldn't you say? Well, that's the thing. We talk in the finance world about how hard it is to outperform but I think for a lot of people, it's it's just a lot of people underperform themselves. They underperform the performance of their own fund. And, and the other the other problem with stocks is it's really lumpy. So the average return over how many years you want to look is eight to ten percent, whatever starting point you want to think about, without taking into account you know taxes and costs and all that stuff. But from any given year, you're not going to see an eight to ten percent return. I think it's something like one third of all years over the last hundred years have been twenty percent gain. And, and so you have these lumpy periods where you have huge gains and huge losses. And that's the problem with people going from one pendulum to another is the, the three years prior to 2022, we had unbelievable returns in the market, right? People forget 2021, the stock market was up over 20%, close to 30%. And now we're down over 20%. And last year, people were feeling fantastic. And this year, people are feeling awful. And unfortunately, it probably should be the opposite, where when things get a little too well, that's when you should be, you know, have your guard up a little bit. And when things are going terribly, that's when you should think, okay, this is this is some opportunity here. But it's really hard to change that mindset and and think that way because uh, it's hard to think stocks being down means stocks are on sale when you're seeing potentially your life savings crater and, and just the feelings that that can bring about. It, it's really difficult. Well, I think people getting in their own way is a big part of why they don't earn the average return. I also think that during the pandemic the interest level in something like individual stocks peaked or spiked, it is it maybe a better word, so much versus where it had been the rest of my career. Um, there's always people who dabble in individual stocks, but really the interest just skyrocketed. And that's one of those things where when you're in an individual stock, if you ask somebody, are you trying to beat the market? They probably wouldn't answer yes. That's not how they really think of it. But the second that you don't own the market, 
I don't know what you're doing. You, you are not owning the market. You probably are trying to beat it, whether you recognize it or not. But the math, the theory, um, we could have a whole episode on why individual stock investing is very risky, if not dangerous. But yet, you know, sometimes I shrug my shoulder when people own individual stocks, if it means they're going to behave with their long-term money. How, how do you look at that aspect of uh, portfolio construction finance theory? That, that, that's certainly something if, if you think about, if you think in a spreadsheet form and you think, why would anyone ever pick stocks? It's, it's really hard. Even the professionals can't do it. You know, I, I've spent my, the first part of my career being a manager of manager and trying to pick active managers that could outperform the market. And I saw these, these people were ridiculously smart. They had great backgrounds. Their education was f- for some of the best universities. They talked to company management. They did all these things and they still underperformed. And it was, it's really hard to, to square that with, wait, this, this person, they really know what they're talking about and they cannot. And, and how is any individual going to outperform if, if they're not tracking this stuff on a daily basis? They don't have a $40,000 Bloomberg subscription or whatever. And I think if you get out of that spreadsheet mentality and, and, and think like everyone should just own index funds all the time. And you think behaviorally, some people just need to scratch that itch. They want to watch CNBC. They want to pick individual stocks. They want to talk about it with their friends or their coworkers or whoever, because they, they put money into this company back in the day when it was $5. Now it's a hundred or whatever it is. But I think you just have to portion control. Basically it's like a diet. So I think if you need to scratch that itch and you want to take 5% of your portfolio or 10% or 15, whatever, and then that allows you to leave the rest of your portfolio alone. There's nothing wrong with that, having a fun portfolio and or a speculative portfolio where I'm going to buy crypto and penny stocks and I'm going to speculate my face off. I'm going to buy options. And I think that's okay as long as that allows you to leave the other stuff alone. And I think some people draw a hard line where when we talk to our clients and they want to do that, I don't think you need to necessarily stop them from doing that because if it means they're going to be not worrying about the rest of their portfolio and this long-term stuff that's more rules-based and process-based, I think that there is there is some room for that. Now, obviously, where you get in trouble is, you said in 2020, Jason Zweig had this, this stat that like from the bottom in March 2020 over the next 12 months, something like 96% of all companies in the Russell 3000 were positive. And it was like a, that's like the highest batting percentage that, you know, we've ever had. And I think it just felt way too easy for people to, I'm going to pick this company because I know this company and this company is going to do, the stock is going to do well. And it doesn't always work like that where good stock equals good company, maybe over the long term, but especially over the short term, good stock, good company could mean really bad stock because it's way overpriced and everyone already knows that it's a good company. And so I think that's the problem for a lot of people is they, they get good results in, in a short time period and they think, why would I need to do this other stuff with my 401k? Why don't I just put it all, what I'm doing in my brokerage account and pick stocks? And I think you just have to have the right mindset of, I'm going to do it with a little piece here. And the great thing is, I think if you give yourself a couple of years, you see that smaller piece, your 10% of your portfolio is underperforming. And I think if even if that happens, you can say, okay, that kind of shows me why I'm, why I'm sticking with this long-term piece over here and not, not messing with it. I couldn't agree more with you. And as an advisor, you were always trying to not just create a portfolio that is going to suit people's, be the best for people's needs, their risks, objectives. Anytime you can give someone sort of a behavioral pass that allows them to stay the course with what you're trying to do, I'm, I'm usually a fan of that. But one thing that strikes me, and maybe you experienced this um, as an institutional manager, like you mentioned, picking active managers that would, or uh, hedge funds who would do better than the rest there really is no such thing as a perfect portfolio. Um, And you can run things through optimizers and everybody wants to think that there is some sort of perfect way to tweak the portfolio here or there, or to know because of valuations or lower expected returns or higher expected returns, that there's an obvious solution in advance. And with hindsight, sure. But, you know, even if we did know with certainty, the perfect portfolio for the next 20 years, I'm not even sure people could stick with it you know, whatever gyrations happened over a 10 or 20 or even five year period. Well, my, my friend, Wes Gray from Alpha, Alpha Architect wrote this piece five or six years ago called the even God would get fired as an active investor. And he went back to like the 20s and looked at he put the stock market, the S&P 500 into deciles. And he, he took over five year period, like the top decile of stocks for every five year period. So the top 10 percent and the returns were like 30 percent a year. It was something ridiculous because you, you pick the best stocks over the next five years, you know it in advance. But if you look at the drawdown profile during the Great Depression, it still lost like 80% and it had all these 30 to 40 to 50% drawdowns But you because you would have had to hold those stocks over five years. And his point was, even if you know in advance what the best portfolio is going to be, a lot of people wouldn't be able to stick with it. And I think that's why it's important for investors to not only 
define like what it is you're going to invest in, but what it is you won't invest in. So Josh Brown, who I work with, always has this analogy of uh, as an advisor, you're a bouncer. And so you're holding the line and there's a lot of stuff that you just won't let in. And even if it could be a good investment opportunity for someone else, it doesn't necessarily have to be for you because maybe it doesn't complement what's already in your portfolio or your plan. And even if it has good income or good total return, expected returns, if you just say no right away, I think it just saves you a lot of time and heartache um, just from understanding that you don't have to pay attention to it. You don't have to waste a bunch of time performing due diligence. If you know that I'm going to invest in A, B, and C, but D, E, and F are just off my plate completely. I, I just, I'm not going to invest in this stuff because I just don't want to. It's not part of my risk appetite or whatever it is. It's not going to be part of my portfolio. I think that just makes things easier if you just swat some things aside right away and say no a lot quicker than worrying because for individual investors, frankly, we've never had a better environment to invest in, right? You have low cost options for anything you could ever imagine. I, I was talking to a colleague the other day, Jim O'Shaughnessy wrote this book, What Works on Wall Street. It's a classic. And I remember reading it in the early 2000s and it was talking about using rules-based approach to buy 50 stocks that are undervalued and how great those returns would be. Just a value stock portfolio. And thinking at the time, there's no way I could afford to buy 50 stocks and rebalance it quarterly because it costs $20 for every trade and they don't have enough money to do that. But now you can do that with a push of a button on an ETF. The ETF probably costs 25 basis points and it's free to trade, right? So there's been so many advances for individual investors. The problem is there's so many options now that you're constantly tempted to invest a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit here. And then you have this mishmash of, it's like a buffet where it's like, what what is this even doing? What's the whole point here of this portfolio? So you don't have like, a, a plan in place or an asset allocation in place that that sort of brings it all together, then then what's the point of having all those options? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Individuals definitely have it better than they ever have before. With the push of a button, you can own one fund that owns the whole market. And in general, I feel like a lot of investment success really just comes down to minimizing those mistakes. And as an allocator myself, when I'm, I love that example that you gave that Josh uses that you're the bouncer at the club. I'm more concerned about implementing a bad idea than missing out on a good one. And I think that's really a reflection of my belief that good investing is boring, that minimizing mistakes is the real key, and that you know we can sometimes just overthink this stuff. And on that note, you know, we've talked about some ways in which you know the spreadsheet answer isn't always the real life answer, where textbook economics doesn't always work. Average stock returns is a lot different to say you're going to capture than capturing them in the moment. You know some of the thoughts behind individual stocks, the perfect perfect portfolio. You know, I'd like to dive into some of the personal finance stuff because Ben, you put out a lot of thoughts on those topics, hitting some real hot button topics like prepaying your mortgage. So today, um, if you, I think, what is it, sixty or eighty percent? There's a big portion of the population that has not had to suffer from these higher interest rates. The math on this for a long, long time has been. Hey, why would you prepay your mortgage if it's two, three, four percent when you can earn that in the stock market? Today, the math's maybe a little bit different, but just kind of curious to get your thoughts on that topic. I, this is something that I, I've certainly changed my mind about. So, you've seen the movie Lost in Translation with Bill Murray? Yep. So, I, I had a friend in college who decided to leave school and go to film school, and he came back and he said, "You guys have to watch this movie. It's it's amazing." And we all watched it. And being in college, I I didn't get it, and I just didn't like it. I'm like, this movie didn't do it for me, and he's like, "No, it's it's fantastic." And I remember not liking it. And then a few years ago, I rewatched it and I loved it on the rewatch. And so I'm like, you know what? I, I can actually change my mind about this. It, you know, I, I have a little more experience. I have a different, you know, viewpoint of it. And I like the movie. So I think that's the same thing with your finances is, is where you're at in life can change your, the way you look at it. So when we, my wife and I got our first mortgage, I think we were paying six and a half percent, which seemed pretty high as recently as 12 months ago, not so high right now. And we refinanced two or three times, and we, I think we cut that in half. And each time we refinanced, we just kept paying the same amount. So we were effectively like doubling our payment up. And we paid it off, and then we sold our house. And I thought, well, what was the point of paying that off early if, if I'm just going to roll it over into a new house? And it, it felt like that money was just sitting there. And I kind of changed my mind and thought, well, I don't need to repay that. And now that we refinanced into a new house with a 3% mortgage, I think that's one of the better inflation hedges that there is on the planet, right? Your your housing has, has appreciated if you count the interest costs that are tax deductible, and then you know you have the inflation hedge piece too, it, it doesn't make any sense for me to pay it off early at all. But I've talked to people who've paid off their mortgage early, even with low rates, and I've never heard one person who regretted it. And so it's one of those things that some people just have this aversion to debt. I am fine at my stage in life holding debt. Maybe 10, 15 years down the line, I'll change my mind again. 
and just like lost in translation. And this time I'll, I'll, I'll change it the other way and I'll, I'll say, but I'm going to be retiring soon. What do I need to hold a mortgage for? So it's time to, time to pay it down. Right. So, I, so I think it's the kind of thing that is, is circumstantial and, and there's no right or wrong answers. I'm sure that a lot of people say, you know, agreed to with 3% mortgages. Why would you ever pay it off early? But some people, that's just the way that they're wired and, and they can't stand it and being in debt keeps them up at night. So I think a lot of it depends on your relationship with debt and, and maybe some family history there and, and that sort of stuff. It, it kind of depends how, how you grew up and what your, what your feelings are with that stuff. Yeah. And if I think people who get their first home right now with this high interest rate will probably always be a little tilted towards prepaying it because it feels high. Now, fortunately, inflation's high too. So it does sort of make it like free money. I know people have a hard time really squaring that idea at times. And inflation isn't a perfect you know, measure of how you're spending, how everyone's spending their basket of goods, so to speak. But the prepaying mortgage thing, I think, will be something we'll be debating or talking about for most of our career. Uh, maybe our you and I will change our minds on those multiple times as well. Buying cars, I've actually heard you on one of your podcasts talking more about this. So there's kind of two things. I used to always kind of sneer at people who leased a car, being like, why are you wasting so much money on a car? On the other hand, um, so my dad leased a car, a new car every three years. And when he retired, he finally bought a car. And you know what? Two years later, he decided he didn't like it and bought another car. So I guess if you like new cars, maybe leasing is the right answer. It just means that you're spending more on cars than if you buy and drive one for 10 years. Do you agree with that? This is another thing. I, I, I was like you. I was a personal finance nerd who just thumbed my nose at people who lease and thought, well, why would you do that? Because it's impossible to never have a car payment, right? If you, if you own your car, if you pay it off when the loan is done, then you're free and clear of a car payment. You can keep driving. And with as high quality as cars are right now, you know, you could drive a car forever. My, my wife had a Honda Accord. She drove all through college and the first few years we were dating. She drove it till it had like 200,000 miles on it. And it was still perfectly fine, right? And so cars these days last a lot longer. I think a lot of this, again, is is circumstantial. I, I actually leased through through a job. I, I kind of got a, <clears throat> a car lease when I joined a new employer. And it was the first time I ever tried it. And I did it and I figured, well, once this lease is up, I'll, I'll buy it and that'll be it. And I kind of liked it. And then I had kids and I realized, oh, wait, these kids are, you have young kids, right? They destroy yep. the inside of a car. And yep. <laughs> there's Cheerios everywhere and goldfish and smush stuff and slime and whatever. And I kind of thought, well, why they're young? I kind of like the idea of having them destroy a car that I don't own, right? It's, it's on the, the car dealership. They're the ones that, that still technically own it. And there, there was a guy who, who sent me a, a really deep dive. Jesse Kramer wrote this blog post called like the true cost of car ownership. And he broke it down and said, it works out to like five cents more per mile driven to lease. If you kind of break it down. And he, he said, the biggest things that matter is how much do you drive? Like if you drive a ton of miles, you probably want to buy instead of lease because you hit that threshold for miles driven in a year and you could have to pay more. And a lot of that is, is how much you drive, how much you're willing to pay for things like maintenance and upkeep and whether you really want to have uh, a new car every three years. You're right. If, if you're buying a new car every two or three years, you should probably lease because what's the point of buying and buying it and then taking that depreciation hit right away and then losing some money. So yeah, I, I was the same way. I, I was surprised. I'm sure there's a lot of personal finance people who tell me I'm an idiot because I, I now lease a car. And I'm sure that's another thing I could change my mind about in the future. But uh, as of right now, I still do that. And and uh, I think it's been okay for me because of my situation, because I don't drive a lot, and because I have kids that, that decide to want to ruin my car all the time. Well, it's a, it's a perfect example of if the goal is to die with the most amount of money in your bank account, then yes, leasing is a bad decision. But you know, I think one of the things that's changed about personal finance over the past decade or so is that there's less spend shaming in general and that you got to figure out what you enjoy. And if you can't afford to live the lifestyle you're living, then yes, you have to make some of these mathematically optimal choices. But if you're successful and you're saving for your goals and that you're, you got your financial house in order, there really is no point in spend shaming. And it started with people saying, hey, like, don't get coffee. And that was like Suze Orman forever ago. And maybe Dave Ramsey jumped on that bandwagon as well. But yeah, I, look, I, I was never... F I I, I was kind of like that too, like compounding is so big when you're young, but I think if you look at every decision through that lens of I'm going to spend $10,000 on a family trip, if I would have taken that, that money instead and invested it in 30 years, it would be worth X. And I think if you look at that through every decision you're making, you're really missing out on, on the compounding of like the memories and the experiences. And so to your point, as long as you're saving in advance, 
I think then you don't spend shame yourself for enjoying it a little bit. What you know, whatever's left over. So as long as you 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 have that saving, and, and I look at it as almost as like saving is part of my bills every month. So I, I don't even think of it as as it's some sort of discretionary money that I'm going to allocate at the end of the month and then I'm going to save. It's no, the saving comes out first, and then whatever's left over, I can I can spend as as I want. I'm not going to feel bad if because I'm buying clothes or taking a trip or or paying a little more for a car, whatever it is, as long as those savings goals are intact. Well, I'm going to take a little bit more of a experimental fun twist here. So winning the lottery, I actually worked with a lottery winner for a while and it is like everything you would expect in a, a lottery winner. They're from a very rural area and they walk in, they got all this gaudy jewelry on. Um, the woman's driving Jim Edmonds old Bentley and she doesn't <laughs> know how to get the windshield wipers to work. I remember the first time I met her, she's trying to have me find where the windshield wipers are in a Bentley as if I drive a Bentley or something. Um, she wanted me to heat up Diet Dr. Pepper in the microwave. It, it was it was amazing. And there was this big debate over lump sum versus annuity payout. And I know that we face this with clients when they have a pension sometimes or an early retirement package. But Ben, if you're winning a lottery and you choose the dollar amount, are you taking a lump sum or are you going to take the annual annuity payment? Jeez. The, I think this this is another circumstantial one where some people would have to, because of their personality and that they would blow it. I actually read a, I did a few studies for one of the books I wrote about lottery. And one of the most fascinating things to me was the, they did all these studies that you're more likely to go bankrupt if you win the lottery than someone who doesn't win the lottery because you, you spend it and you blow it and you get used to this new found wealth. But the other thing that was funny is the neighbors of lottery winners. I think this is a study in Canada actually were more likely to go bankrupt and spend more money and go into credit card debt because they would see their neighbors who just won this money spending money and they would want to keep up. And so they're buying a boat and they're fixing up their house or whatever. And so I think the temptation to spend it all, obviously, if, if you're looking at the spreadsheet, you'd say, well, the time value of money is I'd take the lump sum and invest it. And then I'm much better off. Some people probably need that annuity payment to keep them in line and have the payment every year. Uh, it's like, I mean, the the Bobby Bonilla contract comes up every year for yes, the New York Mets, yes. right? He gets paid like a million dollars a year, whatever it is. If he would have gotten that money up front, chances are he probably could have would have blown it, right? And now he gets it every year. And it's probably, I'm sure he probably is kind of thankful for that and seeing that every year. And so I, I guess the personal finance nerd in me would take the lump sum and say, well, I'll invest it prudently and I'll spend a little now and enjoy it. Uh, but uh, I, I think if you took the annuity, it's it probably makes more sense in terms of rationing it a little bit and and uh, and giving yourself a little something to look forward to every year. Yeah, I think because I am aware of the math, I'd probably have a hard time choosing the annuity because every single year I'd be reminded that I made the wrong math choice. Whereas if this isn't what you do for a living, it might be easier to do that and you know be like a little paycheck, uh, yeah. which would be fun. You know, the other thing that I feel like we don't talk that much about in our profession is investment in health. So there's rising healthcare costs. And I know when we model it in for clients, we largely just assume that their expenses, lifestyle expenses aren't going to change other than grow with inflation. And so, yeah, money's fungible. As you get older, maybe you travel less, you eat out less, and you spend more on healthcare issues. But there's got to be a way that people can start thinking about investing in their own health because just exercising or eating healthy in your 30s, 40s, even 50, really at any age, is going to have a giant impact in how much you need to spend on health in retirement. I can't seem, though, to wrap my head around what the what the guidance we all could give. So I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Any way to solve this problem for me? Well, it's almost like preventative, right, where you're you're putting the work in now to... to fix it down the line. It is tough. So so my friend, Phil Perlman, we saw him at the Future Proof Conference a few weeks ago. Uh, he's putting something together where he's he wants to be an advisor to people and help them get, live healthier lives. So there's a lot of people who have it all figured out. They have the career, they have the finances, they have the family, and then they don't leave enough time or energy devoted to to their health, right? And they're in, they're in really bad shape. And, and you're right, that could take years off your life. That's Time is like the one asset where there's no inequality, right? We all have the same amount of time to live with. And during the day and in the week and the year. And yeah, I think if, if you, if you don't take care of yourself, you could potentially be taking years off of your life or, or potentially setting yourself for some sort of disease. So this, this, this one is probably even harder than fixing people's financial habits, I think, because, uh, I think it's easy to sort of set it and forget it as far as your finances go. Once you, once you do the heavy lifting up front, it's pretty easy. 
with your diet, there, there's this, there's this one book called mindless eating. I was probably out about 10 or 15 years ago. And it's more of a psychology book than it is a diet book, but it talks about how every day people could be faced with something like a hundred to 150 choices when it comes to their diet, because of all the stuff they're tempted with going to the store, what's for lunch, all that stuff. And in that situation, you're constantly forced to make a choice. It's not like investing where you can say, I'm going to press a button and here's my asset allocation and here's when my rebalance is going to take place and here's my contribution. And now that I've said it, I can, I can move on and, and automate my life away with investing and it's easy and, you know, out of sight, out of mind. When it comes to diet and exercise, you actually have to do it every single day. So I think it's, it's way hard. So people make the personal finance thing where you eat right and exercise and it's simple, but not easy. But I think it's, it's way, way harder than, than it is with your finances. And, and I wish I had a good answer. This is one of the reasons I was so thankful to play sports as a young person and, and get introduced to the weight room and, and staying in shape and running and all these sorts of things, because I got instilled in me that, that discipline to do it and stay in shape. And I kind of have kept with that over the years. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, it's, it's, it's much harder. And I wish I had a good, simple solution for people, but really there, there isn't one, unfortunately. That's why some people need to go out and hire a trainer or, or pay for something. That's why, you know, there's, there's different fads that come, whether it's a diet or exercise fad, it seems like every year because people are looking for something that'll help them stick with it. And it's very hard. It doesn't happen. And I think the, the stat from that mindless eating book was something like 95% of all diets, people who lose weight end up getting it back, which is, wow. which is really sad, unfortunately, but that just shows how hard it can be because we, we talked about how it's never been a better time to be an individual investor. It's probably never been easier to get, to make really bad choices with your food decisions, right? Right. The, you used to have to hunt all day for a meal, whereas now you can just go get 2,500 calories at a drive through Yeah, the, the the worst stuff for you is is the easiest and the cheapest, right? And so it's 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 very hard. And, and I don't have as many, many good solutions there for people. Obviously, eating right and, and having some sort of process. I, I think the one thing I've learned as I've gotten older is is I'm much more apt to have like a routine with my life. And sometimes, especially when you have kids, that you, that's kind of thrust upon you whether you want it or not. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, it's almost like sticking to a routine and eating the same meals over and over again, even though that's very boring. If, if you have this, if you make the choices ahead of time and say, I'm going to have these three meals, uh, these healthy meals, at least during the week and then go nuts on the weekend or whatever. But I think planning that sort of thing out probably is, is helpful. I, I honestly didn't really start having some sort of diet plan until my, my twins were born. So I have five-year-old twins. And when they were born, we already had a daughter who was three. I knew I was going to need more energy and I wasn't getting a lot of sleep. And that was the first time in my life I thought I need to change the way that I that I diet because just obviously from a health perspective, but it'll give me more energy too. And I think it actually has. And and that's what I did is just created a routine where I kind of during the week eat the same things over and over again. And it's a little bit healthier and low carb. And I feel like a really old person for saying that that's what I do. But uh, I think that's kind of what you need. That That's what's worked for me, at least. I think everyone else, everyone has something that could potentially work for them, but it's it's really difficult. It does. Ha I actually do something similar. I think it helps that my wife and I aren't huge foodies or not great cooks. And so that makes it easier yeah. to sort of commit to the same sort of meals every time. And yeah, our kids are the same, same age, roughly. I have a nine and five year old, two boys. Um, and so I guess I'll actually ask one last question to wrap us up because we've been talking about, you know, you don't live in a spreadsheet and how what you'd expect to happen, like playing life by the book doesn't always really work out that way. I feel like there's no greater example than with parenting where we all make our own special mistakes. Um, I'm going to give us both a break and just focus on the money aspect. Um, is there anything that you feel like you do well with your kids or you don't do well with your kids in terms of money lessons or money behaviors with them? Or is it just anything goes at this stage? So I've, I've tried. So my, my oldest is eight and I've, I'm trying to instill the idea of saving. And I think she, she's the one who kind of gets it. My, my younger ones don't quite get it. My, my, their grandparents, my parents got them a piggy bank. It's actually an electronic one where if you put it in, it actually counts the money for you. It's kind of cool. Oh. And so, so they, they started trying to with that. And I became a 401k dad where I told my daughter, I, I got this little Betterman account set up for you. If you put money and I'll give you a hundred percent match. And I wanted to show her that she could take a little money when she gets a birthday money. If she's got 50 bucks, I want you to take half of it and spend it and then take the other half and put it in there and I'll match it for you. Right. And that way she can see an instant return. And then she could see it grow a little bit. And, and, and hopefully that's going to be a way to help teach them. I, I, I wish I had, you know, 
you know, trying to explain what you do to your young kids is almost impossible. My, my kids don't, you know, you help people make money or you help with their fine. They don't, they don't get it. So uh, we'll see. I think it's still a little too early to say if uh, I've had any success there, but that's what I'm trying now is just showing that if, if you do this, you're going to be rewarded if you save and put some money away. And then hopefully I can use those investment accounts to teach them the joys of compounding and the risks involved and that sort of stuff. So uh, maybe ask me again in five years to see if I have any success <laughs> there. Well, I think kid personality is going to make a big difference for what it's worth. Like my oldest seems to get the saving thing and we set up on, him up on an allowance and Ron Lieber had a good book. There's a couple other out there on giving allowances. And I, I felt like we were crushing it at first with our oldest, but our youngest, um, it has not been the same experience. I think it's just personality difference. And this idea we were trying to make charitable giving a piece of it where we dropped the ball, like our kids were putting money away to share with others, but we kind of dropped that aspect of it. And I am begging my oldest kid to buy a stock. So he doesn't know he has ah. some index funds that are set. Like when he gets birthday money, I just drop it into an index fund. And I've been begging him when he has, he's super into a brand like, Hey, do you want to buy that stock? And you know, that's what I help people do. He's like, I don't know. He, I don't, I don't think I really want to do that because he's still thinking that the choice is between earning a little bit more money versus saving for some bigger thing. And then I'm like, well, we could buy all the stocks. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's fun to hear yeah. parents, you know, for all those parents listening, even to people who talk about money and give advice all the time, we're still yeah. sorting through it ourselves. So but no, your, your point about the charitable giving is good. We, we try to do it every Christmas. We try to have the kids pick out some, some local charity where they could help. And, and that could be a monetary donation. It also could be they're getting to the age where they can go help and they can put together some food baskets that end up giving away to kids, uh, with families in need. So that kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's not just the money it's, it's volunteering as well. So I do agree that that's a big thing that you you want to impart on, uh, you know, you're in a pretty good position and there are, aren't always people who are like that. So you, you need to help and give back. Yeah. And so parents, you know, if you can't figure out how to do allowance or anything else, maybe that's the easiest thing to do is uh, just make sure that you're giving back with the kids somehow. Don't beat yourself up because here we are. A lot of people look to us for advice and we're still sorting through it ourselves. Um, ben, I'm going to keep you after the show to ask you a few questions that all of you listeners will get to hear throughout the year. I'm going to start having some guests uh, mash up some responses, but I appreciate you being here. Just real quickly, where can people find you on social media, on the internet? all the places. Yeah, just just go to my blog. It's a wealth of common sense. And you can find everything there. We've got a YouTube uh, channel called The Compound, which you can find too. So you can, you can find most of our stuff there. Cool. Well, Ben, thanks again for doing this. Thanks for having me. 